So we're measuring their behavior, their language um, around what they're doing with money against our own set of values based on what we think is right. For some people, we find it shameful um, claiming benefits. And the whole scenario, the whole environment is very much about you don't deserve this, you shouldn't have this, you should feel bad and make sure you're not doing anything wrong. Suddenly we're stepping into our power. The cost of living as it is and energy prices and council tax, they are very difficult things that we are contending with. But don't let that mean that we give up all of our power. That I could say to any of my children, I haven't got the money for that um, or there's not enough. That child may then interpret that I'm not good enough. Welcome to the Humanising Finance podcast with me, Krista McGilvery. Here we get under the skin of money. We expose the emotional, cognitive and psychological factors that affect you and your money. Most importantly, we aim to leave you feeling empowered and with at least one nugget you can action immediately after listening to us. Today, I am thrilled to announce that I have Catherine Thomas Humphreys, who is an award-winning financial coach who originally trained as a financial advisor and is a founder of The Finfluencer. Catherine coaches parents on how to influence their finances to create change for themselves, their families, and the things they're passionate about. She does this using a combination of money mindset coaching and practical finance skills. Catherine, hello. Hi there. You did really well, because that was a mouthful, wasn't it? (laughs) It was, right? (laughs) So many words, but I got it out, and I'm so happy to have you here today. How are you? I'm really pleased. I'm good. I'm good, and I'm really pleased to be here. Um, And I love, you know, just even the the concept of the podcast that we're actually talking about people, humans, with their money, um, rather than money as a, a product or an external uh, force for want of a better term so yeah really excited um, to get going thank you well I'm going to dive right in today we're talking about the intricacies of the interaction of money personalities couples divorcees and the sensitive discussion about how our parents may be responsible for our relationship with money now Catherine I want to dive in and start with new relationships mm-hmm. Now we know that money and the power dynamic can create an interesting circumstance. For example, maybe one earns more and we might have issues around ego, or we've got gender role biases. And then we've got things such as different spending habits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's such an interesting area, right? It is, it is. And I think when we (laughs) briefly talked on this before, when Mm. I see it in my head, I see that we've got our own individual money relationship. So we're like the circle. And then when Mm. we go into a relationship, you've got these two relationships you've already got with your money. And now you've got to make it work in a pair, in a couple, in, in a partnership. And then it's how do those two little circles or big circles overlap? And is it in the right place? Is it a lot? Mm. Um, And sometimes it's okay that there's very little in common in terms of the overlapping, as long as each kind of individual's key needs are being met. Um, So yeah, what I've learned from experience, both my own and my clients, is from the pound sign onwards, it doesn't seem to matter what the numbers are, that relationship is very much um, the two individuals, their experience, their lessons and interpretations, and as you alluded to, parents, and how they're bringing that into that, um, this new third party, this new relationship together. And it can go very, very well, and it can go spectacularly badly wrong. I know, I mean, I, I, when you said that to me the other day, and you described it as like a Venn diagram, I was like, that is really clear. Like I just literally, you know, me and my maths, you know, statistics background, I'm like, I can see it, you know. Um, it's funny, because. When you said that, instantly what came to mind for me is a concept of love languages, right? And how we express our love through various forms and maybe that even translating into our money and, and our, in our relationship. Yeah. Um, what are some of the common themes and challenges you've seen when people join forces um, in terms of their finances? Yeah. Um, so I think there, there tends to be a, um, a status quo, if you like, of almost... This is the thing that we're doing daily that we're not going to talk about. (laughs) Um, And that not talking about it is often where the issues come from, because we might not say what we're thinking, but we can see the other person is doing something with money 
that may not match what we believe is right to do with money. So we're measuring their behaviour, their language, um, around what they're doing with money against our own set of values based on what we think is right. But we've never actually necessarily asked ourselves, well, why am I believing what I believe? And is what I believe right? So the, the judgment still happens even when there's no talking. Um, and then that, so I remember I did a poll on Instagram um, about 18 months ago. Um, and it was asking this question, do you argue about money? And the overarching reply was, we don't argue about money, we just don't talk about it. <laughs> so, which is kind of like a silent argument as far as I'm concerned. But then what happens is it comes out somewhere else. And money touches so many um, aspects of our lives, our identity, ourselves, our future, our past, our present, that even if we're not saying, hey, let's have a talk today about money and budgeting and spending, let's say that never happens, it will come out when I'm cross with you about something completely unrelated. I'll bring out my trump card. Well, you spent all of that money with Amazon and you never told me about the credit card debt. So it will find its way out. So that's a really common um, thing, either not talking or just not having really positive, good conversations around money. Um, and I think sometimes the, the other most common thing I see is um, opposites attracting. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing, but it can cause conflict when it first starts. So you get your saver and you get your spender. <laughs> and that's not a great combination if you haven't got the talking going on. Um, and then probably lastly... Um, almost like we don't recognize the consequences of our finances um, if by not doing them well. And therefore, we've never really considered the consequences in a partnership of what our partner is doing is also affecting us. Um, so that's probably a more practical one. Um, but that does seem to be like we just aren't aware of how money changes in marriages, for example, and how that differs to cohabiting. Um, so those be like the three most common things I see come through um, with money in relationships. Thank you for that. Really interesting, actually, especially, you know, when you talk about us not sense checking or double checking our own values. And, you know, when people react negatively to what other people are doing, and this is you know, if we step back and think about life, it doesn't just apply to our money, right? We often judge others and what many don't do is actually check where is that judgment coming from? And actually it's coming from our own values and what we base to be right or wrong and good and bad. And that's totally personal and totally subjective. It doesn't mean it's overarchingly right or wrong. And it's just really interesting that you raised that point in terms of money mm. and coupledom. Yeah. Well, I remember reading, um, I think it was an article on, I must have Googled something and it said what the, the, no, it was a Royal London piece of research. What were the common reasons for um, falling out about money um, in, a, in a relationship? So I'm reading what Royal London's research has said is the common reasons and it's saying um, my partner spends too much. Um, we aren't um, a good match. Uh, we um, the way we are with money, we can't get along. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, that's not a reason. That's a cause. So the, the people who have answered, my partner spends too much, haven't necessarily looked at them and thought, well, am I a bit tight? Or am I oversaving? Or is it just that they're used to having more money than me? Um, and what they're spending feels right to them. So it's almost like we've recorded it from one person's perspective, which is exactly what we were just saying is that, um, we don't go back one more layer and think, well, why don't I spend more? Or why have I decided the right amount to spend is X? Um, where's that belief come from? And what if I got curious about how I've learned this or interpreted this? And, and what could change if that both parts of that, that conversation came in? I really like that. I really like that. Thank you. And it's funny because that leads on to my second question, actually, uh, um, the second topic, I guess, which is where we move over into divorce. And I just want to mention here a charity called Relate did a study back in 2022. Uh, they interviewed just over 2000 uh, adults and questioned how they felt about their relationship and how happy they were. Mm -hmm. And actually a fifth said they expected divorce. Mm -hmm. And what was more alarming was more than a third 
So they expected that the cost of living crisis is going to put pressure on their relationship in the next year, which is so heartbreaking. Uh, you know, we think about cost of living and we know that it's causing people to struggle financially and sure, but then also the impact that it's having on families and the households and, you know, we could spiral here in this conversation alone about divorce. Um, so I guess linking back to what you just said, actually, and you've possibly touched on it already, you know, kind of looking at the top reasons for money being the key, one of the main reasons for divorce, right? Um, and kind of trying to understand why does that break down? And I guess the starting point here would be what you just said, maybe not looking at actually, why do I have a problem with this person's financial behavior? And, and yeah. yeah, and I think, um if you you know you take that conversation out in any direction to sort of mm. natural conclusions, um, so if I feel a certain way about me and I've interpreted, so you said love languages earlier, so this is actually quite a nice example. So just before we hit record, I shared that my husband bought me a bunch of tulips this morning. Um, so he knows because he's lived with me long enough. It took him a long time to work it out that those small acts of service. Are, a cup of coffee in the morning or a small token that to me is everything if he was to Girl, give I'm me with you. yeah and <laughs> whereas you know if I was to make him a coffee in the morning that wouldn't satisfy the things that he needs from me um and I think this is the, the same so when you said about the the cost of living uh, people anticipating that that's going to be affecting their marriage it's because money touches us on all of these levels so it can be how I feel about myself. It can be what's the future for us and our family. Um, it can be that we, we've got less money and therefore we're arguing more about it. Um, but that's not really because we're arguing in the money. We're arguing because there's a need that hasn't been met. Um, and over the sort of 30 years that I've been a parent, I've been single parent on income support right through to married two incomes with with a good fat you know good in a good position. So I'm aware of how stress um is kind of affected by each of those levels. And a good relationship will survive a tough financial time um, when there's openness and there's conversation and there's a joint effort working to a joint goal. Um, however, a relationship that's challenging or being challenged or where there is maybe not great open conversations about anything, not necessarily money, that will feel the, the pinch of finances more. So from, I guess, from a kind of human perspective, I'd love to have conversations with those because I think that can be avoided. Um, and that, you know, we look at um, our ancestors, our grandparents, parents and their grandparents, um, and we look at where our beliefs come from, but my parents got through, grandparents got through the war um, and they were still together and I think they still liked each other. Um, so finances will put pressure on a relationship, but they won't necessarily finish it off if there's a good relationship that's sitting underneath it. Um, and likewise, a lot of money isn't necessarily going to fix a relationship either. So um, I think what I'm trying to say is the, that sometimes money almost kind of magnifies what's already underneath it yeah and i got that i started to pick up that that thread that you was you was putting across and that makes complete sense and i guess it's almost like because money is such an important part of our lives it's almost the easiest thing the quickest thing you know it's in our lives every day for us to point the finger at as being the reason for the problem whereas actually it's secondary what we do with yeah. our money is secondary to what's happening under the surface. So yeah, it is, point. it is. And I think it's just also highly, highly charged. Um, you know, as well as I do, that we often say it's not about the money, it's about the emotions. So not only on a practical level is money affecting all those layers within our individual lives and relationships, but emotionally we're charged with it as well. So therefore you add all those components together and people report money as one of the biggest causes for divorce or relationship breakdown, especially under financial stress. Thank you, Catherine. Now, at this point, I'd love to hear a bit more about you and kind of why you do this work. What got you here? <laughs> yeah, what got me here? So I think I alluded to it um, a moment ago with over being a parent. Um, mm. So I, I started adult life as a parent I thought I'm just going to get straight in there 
it wasn't <laughs> wasn't deliberate it's just um so what i found is that adulting is quite hard work anyway and you're learning finance and you're learning all the other things that we suddenly have to learn but now i'm i'm doing that with a financial dependent um which i absolutely loved um in terms of energy and having a child but it was extremely difficult um all the, the issues that we still have but on one young person such as cost of childcare um how much it costs to rent, paying the bills, trying to pay for university and hold a job down and be a mum. You put those all together and what you have is a very stressful situation. But younger me interpreted that as I'm not very good at this. <laughs> well, actually, I was doing a very good job. I was just doing a very, it was a very challenging circumstance. Um, and all through that, I became aware that um, we attach meaning to our situation and we attach feelings to a scenario that we then carry forward um, so an example in that situation might be that for some people we find it shameful um, claiming benefits um, and I remember being stood in our old post office queue with people claiming their old age pension as it used to be and a big notice board saying if you know of any frauds then whistle blow and the whole scenario the whole environment is very much about you don't deserve this you shouldn't have this you should feel bad and make sure you're not doing anything wrong and then you're kind of trying to go forward with feelings of guilt and shame and just raise a family um, and I don't know why it occurred to me that maybe I could change that feeling um, and after I think maybe 10, 15, 10, 12 years of being a parent and having now a second one, um, I kind of thought I'm not going to keep repeating this because there's, whilst there is an element of these things are happening, rent does go up, jobs do get lost, there are kind of external things going on, it doesn't mean that I'm sat here as a victim to this. Um, and it doesn't mean that I'm sat here saying I'm guilty of this. There's a, an interplay between my scenario and the outside scenario that I've got some influence on. Um, and it was that decision that took me to changing it. That decision that took me into, well, I'm going to save, I'm going to buy a house, I'm going to get a better job, I'm going to double my income. Um, and it was that single decision plus two or three years of heavy action and focus that turned that situation around from being single and financially um, stressed, very stressed, uh, to being financially viable, um, independent. And that is missing from our schools, our universities, our families. We are often taught there is a them and us, there's money, and then there's what's happening to us. And nobody ever really talks much about we've got um, a dial we've got I'm not going to say control but we've got an influence and we can change um, that scenario and that experience I guess was then what led me into well I'm going to now train as a financial advisor and then through that into coaching um, into what I do now. Thank you I love that and I I guess we've never spoken about this specific part actually your reasons for getting into it no we haven't and I like what you just said there about the them and us and it's, it's, it's hence why we connected right <laughs> it's the same um, approach I take I you know we have the external world we have the economy we have the cost of living we have you know house prices against salary we have all of that yes we do but we still have us and we still have our brains and our way of looking at things and we know that what's happening inside of us affects what we actually do mm. and understandably for many this is a really big shift to take on and it's a big transformation for an individual to make but it's really important and it has such a massive impact on your life clearly as it has on yours as it has on mine mm. and I think it is that balance isn't it because it is suddenly we're stepping into our power we're saying yeah. that all these things are happening. This storm is going on, but I'm now going to decide: Am I going to which way I'm going in my ship, or what colour sail I've got, or you know what? Am I going to make decisions about what I can, even though I can't change what is external? And I think we just need to be careful because occasionally it comes across, and you probably notice it too, um, as though we're saying it's a small thing. Financial struggle is, and it's not. Financial struggle 
it keeps us awake it causes stress we lose our jobs over it um so cost of living as it is and energy prices and council tax they are very difficult things that we are contending with but don't let that mean that we give up all of our power we do have the ability to influence and change what we are and how we interact with it and that's not going to magic it all away and make us you know, manifest millions tomorrow but there's somewhere between those two that black and that white where we've got that um, influence to to change thank you Catherine I like that you just ended on that part as well the um <laughs> we're not gonna be millionaires tomorrow just because we decided so <laughs> which you know I'm not going to say I'm fully against positive affirmation. It has its place, but, you know, you can take it to the extreme and get lost in that, and actually you need some groundwork. Um, at this point, so it's, you know, seemingly we're going through a journey here, and I realised this afterwards, you know, we started with kind of getting into a relationship, we've moved on to um, divorce, which is maybe the wrong way round. Now I'd like to kind of focus on parents. <laughs> I should have done it the other way around, but let's go with it. <laughs> um, so, and kind of it follows nicely, actually, from what we're talking about. You know, the conversation of money increasingly so is involving psychology, you know, as per the work we're doing. And, you know, when we talk about that, we can't not discuss the influence that our upbringing has had on, you know, the development of our own relationship when it comes to money. And you know this can put parents right at the front and center you know in terms of the impact they have on their child's relationship with money you know we're talking about and again i'm sure you have many examples you know when you talk to your clients and they describe the relationship their parents had with money or what it was like at home and some are like it was really tight which is a common one but actually not the only one you also have money was available in abundance which i'm just going to say it here for those of you who didn't have that upbringing that does not directly correlate with you being successful with money. There are many of my clients whose parents had loads of it. You know, they were millionaires, but they are not um, wonderful at managing their money themselves. Or you've got those families who, whose parents maybe didn't have trust around money in itself. So kind of on the topic of families, can we talk about the impact that the relationship a parent has with money has on their children? And here I'm thinking, kind of given the work you do and the fact that you focus on kind of fair, families and parents you might be a bit more privy to that dynamic is there anything you notice around that correlation there um yes and i, I think you've been touching um in and around it with what you've been saying so without doubt and in our very very young years what we experience and see and hear from our parents or the family situation we are in is affecting our beliefs, all of our beliefs, and that would include our money beliefs. But what I've noticed is that doesn't necessarily give the same habit. So you can have two people have exactly the same. So I'll, I'll use me and my sister, for example. We're very close in age, same parents, same upbringing, completely different money habits and very, very, very different beliefs because it's more about how the child interpreted what they saw and then continues to interpret where we can um, exercise control or make changes. So as my sister and I went through our teens, she was going to be the entrepreneurial millionaire. And I remember her saying something like, oh, like I shall have a, a painter and decorator to do all my decorating. And I'm thinking like, but it's really good that you do your own decorating. <laughs> um, and I was going to be the change the world, join the, the political party. So we were very, very different. And yet we experienced almost identical money stories. So I think the key thing is, whatever your habit is, isn't necessarily directly related. You know, if you've not had money, it doesn't mean you're going to do the same thing as the person next to you who has also experienced scarcity. Um, and I think as well, what I see is that fear um, is the overriding emotion that comes through, that gets passed down from parents to their children. Um, and they then grow up and, and remain fearful around money. Uh, fearful that it's going to end, fearful it's going to run out, fearful there's not enough, fearful that they don't know what to do with it. Um, and fear is a kind of, in terms of an emotion, it's, it's always there. And it's the one that if we can swap that to the positives, to trust, to faith, to, to gratitude, to something positive... I find that's usually the, the biggest change, but fear itself sort of gets in the way. So I think um, 
we repeat things we hear. Uh, fear, anxiety and stress tend to be the ones that, from my experience, have the most negative impact. But you can take two people and put them through a very, very similar belief set and it's down to how they interpret it. And also whether we're willing to continue to accept it. And I will just say, because it's very easy for me to say, I blame my parents for my, my money. Um, I'm obviously a parent myself, um, and you've heard briefly that kind of 30 years story. So what my daughter would have heard about money from the younger me to what my now younger son hears about money is going to be very, very different. So I'd say don't beat yourself up. <laughs> um, it's, it's all fixable. Um, so I think it's too easy that maybe this is this is a... An obs a personal observation I don't think there's any basis to it at all but it does feel a little bit like um the way we parent we like we can't do anything wrong without having to feel guilty you know we're just people we're going to say the wrong thing we're going to um have a little mini meltdown about money in front of the kids it's not the end of the world so let's not put ourselves up on a pedestal that is is unachievable um there are things you can do I think maybe we'll explore those a little bit in in a moment but yeah Parents are, without doubt, the biggest influence, but it's down to interpretation. I like that. And just on your last point there, actually, you mentioned something that just came to mind, actually, uh, when you first started talking, when you spoke about your children and the fact that they would have heard different things from you because you was at different stages in your life. And I think, is it... Um, Gabor Mate, I think I've pronounced his name right. Uh, he, I've seen a clip on, from him talking about how two children born from the same parents can be so different. And he highlighted the point that, well, when your parents had those children, they were at different points in their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think some people are really often quite confused as to, well, why is my brother or sister like that when it comes to X, Y, Z? And mm -hmm. your parents were different, you are different. The fundamentals of what makes you up and how you interpret, like you said, mm -hmm. are very different. Um, yeah. And as well, I think another theory that I've, or another way of understanding the difference or the lack of direct correlation between your parents' money story and your money story is maybe even simplifying to say you could either reject or accept yeah. kind of your parents' approach to finance. Yeah. And like. I think that's probably our starting point, isn't it? So we look at it, we think, mm, take it, keep it, dump it. And then we refine. Um, and we, we sort of talked about divorce and the, the impact a divorce will have on a person's relationship for when they enter the next one is very, very um, strong. So whilst the, the children money beliefs are there, that will have then been affected again by other uh, traumas or other challenges um, and experiences. Um, and not dissimilar to, to my realisation that, hey, I've got some say here. That is a, a realisation you don't come back round from. Um, so ongoing shaping um, and I think that's why I'd say don't worry too much <laughs> because like any element of self-development it's always there for us to go and put some attention and some energy into um, all aspects of ourselves and that includes money relationship along with every other aspect that we would want to develop I like that so I'm just thinking of those who may be listening and I imagine lots of parents um, kind of given the current economy the state of things that are happening right now if there are parents listening who are struggling financially possibly experiencing shame embarrassment and guilt about their circumstances which is very understandable do you have any advice for them in terms of handling their finances as a parent and maybe even managing that guilt that they may feel yeah, um, I think the first thing I would suggest that they, they do is to, to take the heat out of it. Um, so, so let's say someone is struggling and maybe their children are wanting something and we've got that uh, difficult moment of having to explain to a child that we, there's not enough money for that at the moment. Um, there's so many ways that conversation could go in a family, depending on you know who's tired, who's feeling stressed. Um, and I think if we take the heat out of it a little bit so that it's not going to become um, an out of control scene, um, which we've all seen. Um, and that's the kind of money arguments and disagreements, perhaps, that partners really struggle. 
And if you're having that kind of disagreement and your children are in your house, they are witnessing it. And if they're young, that is feeding into to their beliefs. So firstly, it's about taking the heat out of it, that um, to neutralize and normalize money talk. And I think one of the easiest ways to normalize it and to neutralize it is to make it a daily thing. So rather than being it's payday and those run up and that stress and not having enough is to bring it right in every single day just as we would with cleaning our teeth or going for a run or developing another a good habit that we want to develop um and then i think it's around well how can i say the same thing with spin um with some creativity and this is a lesson i learned very very early on that i could say to any of my children i haven't got the money for that um or there's not enough that child may then interpret that I'm not good enough. And this is going back to that interplay of interpretation. Um, Or I might think, well, I really want to give it to them, so I'm going to borrow it and give it to them, and now I'm stressed because I owe money over here. So that's another um, way that's challenging to do it. So I think what we have as humans that I love is we're immensely creative. So I used to just find a way of putting spin on with my daughter, so maybe we couldn't afford it. So... Well, that's not in today's uh, spend amount, but how could we go and make some money if we wanted to do that next time? And then that little child imagination is off creating businesses. So you're you're using an, a fact, and the fact is there isn't quite enough money for this extra thing that we want, but you're turning it into a positive. How can we make some more? How can we find some more? How can we create it? Um, how can we decide what's a need and what's a want? Um, And I think it really is. These are adult money habits. You know, do I have both of these things or do I wait till next week to have the one I really want? Um, So, yeah, bring that in, make it playful, make it creative and really try and normalize it. If you're talking money, making it, spending it, saving it in one context every single day, just like you were talking about breakfast. um, I think that diffuses an awful lot. They were so lovely. I like them a lot. Thank you. Um, I like the fact that you started with removing the heat, which mm. I guess tackles the guilt part and actually diluting it. And, and and as well, just linking it back to the fact this was specifically for parents. I like that you gave the parent back the power to control the narrative. Because as parents, you have a lot of power. I mean, really random, but I remember my mum telling me when we were naughty or didn't go to bed, she'd tell me that helicopters would fly over the house and take us away. And I believed it. <laughs> I mean, now saying it with my understanding of how trauma has developed, I'm like, Mum, that was quite mean. <laughs> it, and it was, <laughs> but she controlled the narrative, and mm. you know, or, you know, saying police will come and arrest her, or whatever craziness. But you know, here, in terms of the guilt that a parent and I see, I'm not a parent myself, but all of my friends are, and I can see how they feel so guilty or they feel so bad that they can't give certain things to their children and. Mm. But, but I, you know, and that still is the case, fine, they can't do that at that minute, but I really like the fact that you've given them the power to transform that situation to an empowering one, making it fun, and actually also teaching the child some useful skills. Me and my entrepreneurship mind and focus, I'm like, you are now teaching this child about business. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. You're teaching actual manifestation, not wave a wand and there's your million. <laughs> Well, yeah we need some magic and create some so how are we going to do that so um which uh yeah i think it's it's fascinating and i think it's one of those we, you, we could talk so many so many areas but i think even if it's like the one takeaway up to this point is just like that little light bulb's gone on in that there's if we're aware of how we feel and are and interact with money even just that awareness, now we've got a whole playground and as that awareness and curiosity grows and behaviours can change. So yeah, even if that's the only thing that you've taken away is I can be aware of this and therefore what else can I do differently? Or what can I do that's already working that I can keep doing the same? I love that, I really do. Um, And actually, yeah, I'm gonna take that to my friends. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when they have moments and they're struggling and I can see signs of that guilt or whatever. Mm. Yeah. So we're nearing the end and I have one question here for you. Just to kind of end it positively. Um, and I'm using some, I think, some trendy, some trendy language here. So off the back of what you shared, 
Could you share some green money relationship flags with us? So what would you describe as healthy and sexy money coupledom? <laughs> oh. Yes. So I think um, <laughs> sticking to, to money as the, the um, openness. Um, so when I'm talking about open relationships, I really am. You know, you, sh- you really want to foster something where you can go to each other and it doesn't matter what that topic is, that you know it's going to be well received. There's not going to be heat or friction or argument um, and the, the yucky feelings. So um, my husband and I have got to that point. We've been together 16 years. It wasn't there at the beginning. Um, but I know I can just tap on his shoulder and come up with something that um, the, the thing that came to mind I actually don't want to share I might share with you privately afterwards um, but I know that I can <laughs> share anything with him and there's not a big deal and vice versa um, he's not going to surprise me so I think a green flag is are they really boring about money <laughs> do you understand them and know them um, so that would be the ideal you might be on a journey toward that so keep practicing it keep having those you know I I would say start with you so if you're not judging you and you're not judging them you will feel a lot less judged by other people so start with with what you can control um and then other green things would be um do they immediately attend to their post so post comes in opened dealt with filed that's a lovely habit and that says a lot as does the the opposite habit um and does it all feel fair so with money you're never going to get equal um especially in the sort of families that i work with where perhaps we've got children from a previous relationship children that are shared children that are older um you're never going to get everybody gets exactly the same number or the same pounds um so let go of it being equal but is it equitable does it feel fair and i think if you can have openness a little bit of money boredom (laughs) fairness um and enough um shared similarity so you don't want to be the same um but if you've got an important goal so it's really important to you to retire 10 years early or it's really important to you that the children do x and that you would not compromise on that that is at least shared in that area you can be as different as you like with whether you shop at amazon or not or um what your hobbies are but are there really key things um do you line up is your venn diagram overlapping in those areas thank you i like that and i like that you looped it right back to the venn diagram as well um and i I like the fact that you mentioned that it's a journey you know i think sometimes we can be what you mentioned it earlier actually quite black and white and you know cut and dry and it's like either this or or that and actually you may not be there yet but it takes time and even for yourself it took time for you guys to build up to that point and i guess you know like with relationship stuff in general forgetting money it's it's you know what's the intention are are you motivated are you both looking for the same kind of end goal are you working towards the same point and as long as you are then okay you might not be there yet but you're working towards it and that's more important i think um thank you catherine you're welcome you're welcome this has been a wonderful discussion and i imagine people have found it really useful um could you tell people how they can find you i will put the link but do Oh, lovely. Um, so I can be found if you would go to my website, which is thefinfluenza.co.uk, and that name comes right back from that why, that journey, that every one of us is our own financial influence. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's about empowering, stepping into our own space to influence our finances. So come and find me there. Um, I blog there weekly or on Instagram or just reach out. I've got booking calendars on my website. So if you want just... To have a quick rant, um, a quick conversation, come as a, a couple to try and work something out together or just can't agree on how to write a will, then book in and I will gladly, without judgment, give you a very safe space to, to be you with, with your money and see if I can help you from there. Thank you. And do you have any parting words for our listeners? Today? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me think. I, was just I guess right. our focus was parents, right? And 
Our focus was parents, wasn't it? Um, So if you want to, I do um, on my blog every week write either about ethical or parental or family finance. Um, So I think you were very kindly going to share that link. Um, But I think if there was one thing that I would just sort of plant as a seed for you to, as you're listening, just to walk away from is ask yourself, you know, where's that belief come from? Where's that thought? You know, why are you a saver? Why are you a spender? What triggers that? And just, you know, start questions. Uh, The more questions you ask, the more you're going to start to find out about yourself. Um, So, and I think that that's for every individual for development. That's the only place that we can start is just getting really curious as to how or why we are the way that we are. Catherine, thank you so much. It's been an amazing conversation. Uh, I was taking notes, um, especially the piece about the parents and how I can help them, um, help them feel better. Um, So yeah, thank you for joining us today. You're very, very welcome. And if you stay online after recording, I will share my confession. (laughs) (laughs) I want to (laughs) know. Until next time, guys. A quick roundup. I really hope you enjoyed today's session. And I wanted to show you something that Catherine um, kindly sent to me in the early days of our relationship blossoming and it was a money plant. So you can see that my fingers aren't very green and I have kept it in the original. Anyway, it's a money plant. Thank you, Catherine. It was great talking to Catherine today and I hope you leave with some really interesting points about being in a relationship and money and avoiding divorce and parenting and hopefully removing the guilt you may feel in these current times when it comes to the cost of living crisis and the you know reduced amount of money you may have but how we can turn that around until next time crystal signing out